I want to clap, so I will clap, <laughs> even though I'm a crowd of four here. Um, let us overcome the awkwardness of this. If you want to clap right now, clap on your couch. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, let, let, I just pray right now, that was my prayer all morning today, that it's not only the technology that will connect us, that I just pray that the Holy Spirit connects us into one body of Christ, overcoming this huge obstacle, overcoming this difficulty right now. I pray that we are still the gathering of the people of Christ. We are one body of Christ worshiping today together. So uh, we continue our Lenten series uh, called I Am. Uh, that is a name that God called himself. Uh, when God chose Moses uh, to go to Egypt, tell a bunch of people to follow him into the desert, and also tell the Pharaoh that that's what's going to happen, Moses had some doubts. And in uh, his negotiations with God, at some point he said, well, God, who are you? What do I tell people? Who sent me? Tell me your name. And God said, I am. And what God has done since then, through everything that we read in the scripture, through the life and the ministry and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, through the life of the church, God has been revealing who he is. So uh, during this Lent, which is a very special uh, time during the life of the church, it's uh, uh, the time before we celebrate Easter, before we celebrate resurrection of Christ, what made us into Christians, what gave us that hope. Before all of that, the whole church takes several weeks to reflect more deeper in their relationship with God, on their faith, uh, to um, dig deeper into spiritual practices that feed our faith. A lot of you are reading your scripture more often. A lot of you are praying, and all of this is great. So we as a church together are walking through this series, discussing and discovering who God is. So Lance already introduced us to uh, God, who is the bread of life, and that one was easy. Super easy, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for going back and explaining the I am saying, because for the first two weeks I said, I'm going to do that, I'm gonna do, and I never did. So oh, thank okay. you for doing well, that. Well, you see, yeah, we practiced. No, we did not. Uh, then uh, last week, uh, Lance was uh, telling us uh, what it means that God is light. Jesus says, I am light. And that one is also easy. I'm pretty sure that Clint can come up with probably a dozen of songs that say, you know, sure, God is light. Yes. Well, uh, all of this is great. Well, uh, when we were planning this series, I got the I am the gate. Easiest. Yeah, That was the real simple one. Because <laughs> yeah, I was supposed to be out of town this week. It was supposed to be spring break. I wasn't here. Genia, you got gate, and I'll be back for easy stuff. I'll be yeah. back for Shepherd. Yeah, so I got the gate, and I've been reading this scripture. Uh, we will be, by the way, in the Gospel of John. If you want to start getting your Bibles out, if you are at home, and this is the time when you are looking for your Bible for the first time in a while, this is where you right now get up and go and try to find where your Bible is. So we will be in Gospel of John, but... Uh, yeah, so the, uh, uh, the scripture that I got was, I'm the gate. And for the last couple of weeks, I've been reading it and wondering, well, God, what is it that you are saying? Because I'm kind of not quite getting it. Um, it's super simple, Jeannie. I don't know why this is so hard for you. I'm a gate. We all get it. We all talk that way. Yes, you see, but I have an inquisitive mind. Oh, so okay. I'm like, is it the gate open? Is the gate closed? Is the gate for sale? Is, is the gate to be built? <laughs> is the gate to be repaired? Should I go and inspect my gate? Like, I wasn't sure where I'm going with all of this gate stuff. So what helped me was go a little bit up uh, in the text that I was assigned and actually reading, like, what is happening? What is it that Jesus is talking about? And that clarified a lot. Also, as, uh, uh, I, as many of us, probably all of us, have been following the news and uh, following what has been unfolding in the world, and literally like every hour the situation has been changing. I know in the beginning of the week we were still hopeful, we were still going on, uh, business as usual. Um, but as the week has been unfolding, and I've been coming back to that text, the message that was standing up to me um, was so clear that through, the, through what we will read today, all that God is trying to say is that, yes, I am the gate, which means that I am the source of that safety and security and stability that you need, and I'm the only one. 
And that is where I landed today. And I explain that because um, it is one of those preacher moments when the text has been selected earlier, but then as life goes on, um, God showed me where to go with it today. So uh, we will start reading uh, in uh, the Gospel of John in chapter 10, and I will uh, take us from the very beginning of the chapter. So there will be some introduction before we get to the whole gate business. But um, follow along with me. I hope by now you got all of your Bibles ready. Uh, And uh, we will start reading um, in verse 1. So Jesus speaks to the Pharisees and tells them, I assure you that whoever doesn't enter into the sheep pen through the gate but climbs over the wall is a thief and an outlaw. The one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The guard at the gate opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and and leads them out. Whenever he has gathered all of his sheep, he goes before them and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger, but will run away because they don't know the stranger's voice. Let's just pause here. Don't, don't, don't sneak. Don't, don't look what, the, what, what happens next. I want to just hang in there. So the crowd is listening to Jesus. And what he's explaining to them, they're like, yeah, we get it. Yeah, you're describing what you know, shepherds do. That, 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 that's great. So why are you telling us that? Because you are telling us something that's important. So we're trying to figure out what is it that you are telling us. So uh, we have this uh, um, human ability to grasp on some facts and some knowledge that's available to us. And then our survival instinct kicks in, our creativity kicks in, our social need for communication kicks in, and in all of that big mess, what comes out is that people start like, whoa, 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 so what is he talking about? Is somebody coming after my sheep today? Hmm. Is that what he's saying? Is the thief coming to steal my sheep? Now, how is my shepherd? Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? Now another crowd is like, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. He's saying that there are some shepherds that have this amazing voice. I mean, once they start talking to sheep, the sheep just follows along. They go wherever they go. And somebody's standing there, well, my shepherd has an ugly voice. Gee, nobody's listening to him. Like, I mean, it's hard to get a good shepherd. It's hard to get a good shepherd. So yeah. what is happening is that the crowd starts like, hey, do, do, I, I need a good shepherd. Do you know a good shepherd? Can't find one. Okay, Clint, you know a guy who knows a guy? I mean, I, I'll, give you, I'll give you two shekels right now. No. Just give me the number. I need a good shepherd. I need to make sure that nobody's coming for my sheep. Because that's what he's saying. I mean, the teacher is saying that. I'm, I'm listening. God, I'm all with you. I'm, I'm following. I'm following. So the crowd gets into that panic. And I'm joking about it. I'm going to just drop another joke right now. Bear with me. But that kind of sounds familiar this week. Hmm. I mean, there is a reason why... Amazon is out of toilet paper until April 15th. I mean, people are just doing their best at being people. That is what they are doing. We've been doing it since we were created. So Jesus looks at all of this commotion, and that's where we go back to the scripture. So now you are allowed to look at verse 6. Those who heard Jesus use this analogy didn't understand what he was saying. They didn't get it. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, all I'm trying to tell you is that I am the source of security and safety and stability. Everything else is fragile. Everything else is an illusion. I am the one who can provide that kind of a peace that I have just described to you talking about the Good Shepherd. They didn't get it. So if you ever read the scripture and you don't get it, like don't get upset, God is pretty much used to it by now. So (laughs) um, Jesus seeing that people are not getting it, whatever it is that they were discussing, whether they were going with the finding a good shepherd, finding a good guy, discussing the voices that shepherds have and what voice is more effective with sheep, whatever. Jesus says, you know what, I'm going to try again because they didn't get it. I'm just going to try again. Lance, you've tried a few times jokes, and they just kind of didn't work. (laughs) How dare you, Virginia? (laughs) And then you kind of chuckle, (laughs) and then you move on. So... None of this ne- sounds familiar. This is ne- all new when, to me. It, when it happens next time, this is your Jesus never- moment. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, Jesus did that. You Thank know. you. He looks at the crowd. They're confused. He's like, you know what? I'm going to try again. So he is now twisting the story a little bit, trying to be a little bit more clear. And that's what he says. I assure you that I am the gate for the sheep. 
All who came before me were thieves and outlaws, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief enters only to steal, to kill, and destroy. I came so that they could have life. Indeed, so that they could live life to the fullest. God speaks to us through the reading of the scripture. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you for being such good. <laughs> it's not my first time at church. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Jesus is trying again, and he's saying, okay, guys, you're already thinking about your sheep. You're already thinking about your gates, where your sheep are. Let me, let me tell you, I'm the gate that keeps sheep safe. I'm the one that opens when it needs to open for sheep to go out, to come back, to have a full normal life. I am that source. You don't need anything else. You don't need anyone else. And uh, as I read the story again, just probably like yesterday, uh, that is when I thought, well, God, this is what, this is what you are trying to tell us today. We are so overcome by fear. We're so overcome right now by stress of the, um, of the crisis. We don't know what to do a whole lot of times. Um, and you are bringing us a very clear message to look up to you as the source of safety and security. So I wanted to ask right now, Clint and Lance, if you guys think back at your life and if you feel that there were moments there were times when you were overcome by that fear. What was it like? What was going on? Clint, you want to start? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me, I'm, I'm a terrible decision maker. That song, Waymaker, I wish decision maker was in there too. <laughs> God would just make the decisions for me. Um, but I remember, uh, this is right before I turned 30, which I won't say how long ago that was, but uh, I decided that... After some guidance and some prayer and talking with my wife, uh, I wanted to make a career change. Um, and that's the first thing that comes to mind is just the uncertainty of, you know, you've done something for X amount of years and you think you're pretty good at it and then you're just going to jump in and start all over with something brand new. And now you've got a house and you've got kids and you've got a marriage yeah. and all that stuff. Oh, too. yeah, yeah. And, you know, we were married and we had a six-month-old at the time when we made that Perfect decision. Perfect time. So, Shake yeah, it up, was great. man. Mix it, it up. Great. My wife. <laughs> My wife was super excited about mm -hmm. the big decisions and changes we were making, so um, as was I. But, uh, you know, I, I think that this really, that safety and security uh, that God provides um, and the guidance of the Good Shepherd and just knowing that whatever decision that we did make, um, that we were going to be okay, uh, but it, it was full of uncertainty and just not knowing what was going to happen. Um, yeah. If I can ask, Clint, mm -hmm. for you, when it comes to hearing from God or feeling that peace, what's that rhythm look like in your life? Is that mostly, obviously, you're a worship leader, and, and, and music is really important to you. Is it, is it through reading scripture? Is it through prayer? Is it conversations with your loved ones? Is, which of those avenues do you find you most experience that peace or that comfort or that direction? I'm, I'm a bit of an extrovert, but I also tend to need that time by myself to really just think on something. Um, and pray on my own, but really and truly, it's talking with other people, talking mm -hmm. it out. Um, and, and again, just not always, you can hear voices from your friends and your family telling you what to do, but when you sit in prayer and that answer doesn't come, mm -hmm. I want that decision maker, I want God to be that decision yeah. maker for me. Um, but I, yeah, again, I think it just, that's kind of where I'm, I get that energy and get that direction is from others and just conversations. I appreciate you saying that because I think so many people expect that they'll be silent in prayer and they'll have a mm -hmm. shawl over their lap and a cup of green tea and the answer will just come to them. <laughs> and that's great and it does work for so many people, but other people yeah. find it in different ways. We're made different. God reaches us in different ways and I appreciate you sharing Absolutely. how you felt it in your life. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I am thinking back to also uh, a transition in my life that literally changed the whole direction of my life. But... Um, it was also a time of fear. Um, I came to the United States in 2006, and um, what that meant for me was quitting my full-time job in Russia that provided for all of my needs, that made me feel very safe and secure, and coming here, starting a new career, starting a new path, going to school, but financial security and stability that I felt in Russia because I was the provider. Like, if I get to my work, I will get paid 
bills are going to get paid, life is good, life is stable, nothing is shaking, everything is very cut and clear. When I come to the United States on a student visa, one of the things that um, is a requirement is that you are not allowed to work. So something that was so stable in my life was taken away from me. And I suddenly became dependent on the love offerings and gifts of a whole lot of people, and a lot of them didn't know me, and I barely knew them. Mm. And, uh, and it was just week by week of me getting Walmart gift cards or little checks, or, um, and that is what sustained me through several years until I changed my immigration status, until I was allowed to get a job. And I remember that um, even though it was a time of great blessing and God was working in my life and God was very present and changing the entire direction where I was going, I went to seminary, I answered God's call to ministry, but underlying all of that was constant fear of financial insecurity. What if the Walmart card is not gonna come when I need gas? What if uh, people who send me $50 checks will not send it for whatever reason? How am I, how am I, how am I gonna get groceries? Um, so that fear was eating up the realization how blessed I am. Yeah. Mm. And uh, I struggled with it, I prayed about it, I knew that this is not something that God wants me to feel. I probably highlighted and underlined every single verse in the Bible that said, do not fear. It didn't work, I still feared. And uh, I just lived with that fear. I lived with it until my situation changed and I was able to work. And um, it was crushing, it was soul crushing many times. You talked about living with that, and I didn't realize until you were telling it now, that wasn't you needing to, to live in that space of trust and vulnerability for a couple hours mm -hmm. or even a, a couple weeks. It mm -hmm. was years. I yes. never realized. So, because I, I feel like it's, we talk a lot of times like you just need to trust and power through mm -hmm. this moment. And we always kind of imagine that moment being really short. No, it was years. What was it like to live for years, but at the same time with the fear, but also with that constant it's sustaining a, It's a grace. struggle. It's a constant struggle. It's a constant prayer or self-talk that, look, these people are faithful, the people are supporting you. For whatever reason, they keep sending you money that you need and they send you just enough. Everything that you need is covered. But mm. I'm also, like, I like to have things under my control. I like to know that if I have $1.38 into my account, I know when my paycheck kicks in. I don't like sitting there and waiting. Yeah, I can't for... relate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it was a struggle. It was a struggle, and I just lived with it until it was over. One of the things that we were talking about as we were coming together and getting ready to share is the reality of fear that exists in this moment. And I don't know about y'all, uh, if your Christian social media feed has a lot of people posting, do not fear, do not fear, do not mm -hmm. fear, over and over again. And that's absolutely right and absolutely true, but I wanna talk a little bit about that do not fear, and particularly in this context of Jesus, as a invitation rather than a commandment, mm -hmm. as an invitation into grace and trust, rather than just a commandment, you know, because you were trying, I'm really, really scared, yes. I'm being told, don't fear, don't fear, and that's not helping me. No, it didn't help at all. Yeah, so is there a way that, that maybe we can hear about this, this Christ who's the good shepherd, who's the gate, who brings us mm -hmm. into the pen, and where we can enter and exit and live in that kind of trust, and so I want to share uh, a bit of my own experience. So um, this is not my first experience with an extended time of social distancing or even with quarantine. Um, I've had probably added up together over a year of my life has mm -hmm. been lived in some form of social distancing or quarantine. And so I've shared a couple times in the gathering. I'm, I think y'all have both heard that in 2009, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. It had a recurrence of that cancer in 2012. And so when you have the kind of cancer that I had, which was a cancer of the immune system, the best treatment is chemotherapy. And so chemotherapy is just poison. It, uh, if you've ever walked alongside someone who's going through cancer, the, the chemotherapy uh, attacks the tumors and hurts the tumors, but it also hurts a lot of the rest of you. And the kinds of uh, chemotherapies that I were taking were really damaging to the bone marrow. And mm -hmm. in addition to fighting off the tumors, it was also killing my bone marrow. And so in your body, I did not know this because I did not pay much attention in eighth grade science, but your bone marrow is where your blood cells are made. Those are your red blood cells that carry oxygen and your white blood cells that fight disease. And so over and over again in 2009 for six months while I'm taking uh, all these treatments, I am constantly in an immunosuppressed place. I am vulnerable. I'm wearing a mask. I can't go out in public. It's really scary. And I lived in that place for a long time. Wow. 
Fortunately, it got better. Um, cancer went away for a while and it came back in 2012. And the kind of cancer um, at that point that I had that came back was so scary that the best treatment was just tons and tons of tons of chemo to the point where it would actually kill all my bone marrow. They took some bone marrow out beforehand, and then it would be a transplant of that bone marrow back into me that would save my life. And as a part of that process, they gave me so much chemotherapy uh, that all my bone marrow died. And so every day, I was in the hospital for about a month overall. They would come into the room, and they would take that little whiteboard on the door, and they would write my white blood cell counts. And I don't remember what the healthy ones are supposed to be. I know mine were in the triple digits, and the double digits, mm. and then nine, five, zero. It was gone. So... I live, when we talk about this fear of disease, when we talk about this fear of other people, this fear of connection and, and what, can, what it can do to you, I, I felt like I, I really know that place. I spent a lot of time in that place. Even on the other side of that, I was so vulnerable for so long, I had to live in this way. And I remember talking to someone I love very much, a really close family member of mine, and they wanted so badly for me to not worry. They would constantly say, don't be afraid. <laughs> don't be afraid. Just, just don't be afraid. Just, Did it work? Just power through. I'm, uh, it, it wasn't as easy as that. And they were, of course, they're being encouraging me. They're being so supportive. They're being so great. And this isn't a person with a super strong, super strong faith background, but just don't be afraid. Don't worry. And at one point, I, I had to tell them, I'm afraid because this is scary. I'm, I'm afraid because this is scary. And I have to accept it. And I have to open my arms up to it. And I have to let that in. I need to let that fear in. Because it's in actually living in and accepting that fear that I can begin to accept the grace that comes alongside it. And this person had a hard time understanding that. They just wanted to say, shut out. Just don't fear. Don't feel. Just, just ignore it. Just power through. And, and I couldn't do that. I remember one time I was praying. Um, it was in my backyard at my little house in Oakhurst at the time. My immune system shot. I'm extremely vulnerable. I've got a six-week-old baby. I'm, I'm worried about leaving uh, my wife a widow. I'm worried about that child. And I was praying. And one of the few times in my life where I really felt the, the, an answer back from God. I really felt a word from God. I really felt something speaking back to my prayer. Um, I heard back, you will be okay. It will be okay. Things will be okay. And it was amazing when I heard that because the word that I heard didn't say, you will be okay, and I promise you that you won't get sick. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you will be okay, and I promise the medical outcome is exactly what you want. It wasn't, you will be okay, and I promise nothing bad is ever going to happen to you again. It wasn't that. It was, you will be okay. Your child, your wife, they will be okay. Everything ultimately will be okay. That doesn't mean there won't be a scary time. It doesn't mean there won't be a threat of illness. It doesn't mean that things won't be really hard for you at some point. But ultimately, it will be okay. That's my promise to you. That's what I heard, and that's what I felt. And so when you hear these words about don't fear, and I'm providing, it isn't a commandment, don't fear, because yeah. to fear would be a lack of trust or a lack of faith. It's an invitation, don't fear. It's an invitation to recognize, no, this is scary. No, there are thieves and robbers. No, there mm -hmm. are things that hurt and maim and kill. No, there's disease. No, there's illness. Destroy. There's so many things yeah. that can, can, are good reasons for fear, but at the same time, I need you to know everything will be okay. It's an invitation to even when you're facing storms, even when you're facing challenges, even when you're facing economic uncertainty, even when you're facing uh, upheaval in your career path, even when you're facing all sorts of difficulties, everything will be okay. It's an invitation. If you want, you can trust in that. If you want, you can believe in that. If you want, you can live in that way. Yeah. So that's our word to you today. Christ is the gate. Entering through him is into this pen of life. And if you choose to live in that way, you can enter and exit, go in and go out. In times of difficulty, in times of stress, in times of illness, in times of worry, Christ is there for us. And this commandment to do not fear is not a commandment so much as it is an invitation to acknowledge, feel those fears, know that it's scary, and even doing so, trust that everything will be okay because Christ said it would be. We're going to close in a word of prayer in just a moment. And the typical rhythm for us is to come together physically for the sacrament of communion. Obviously, that's not going to work uh, today. And so what we're going to do instead is the prayer of examine. We talked about this a few weeks ago in a sermon series earlier in the year, and we were talking about prayer. Prayer of examine is a rhythm of prayer. It's a rhythm of pausing and reflecting on our own lives. I want to put you on the spot, Clint. Would you mind playing the prayer chords underneath us as we pray? Sure. Would you mind pulling up and yeah, giving us a little bit of music that goes with it um, just to help us uh, for coming together in prayer? 
So what I'm going to lead us in is the prayer of examine. Uh, I'm going to guide us in a couple different things to become aware of. I'm going to guide us in some reflection. I'm going to invite us in Christ's presence and promise to us as we go forward. So together as the gathering in diaspora, <laughs> together united by the spirit of Christ, together as one church, wherever we are in worship today, please come together and join me in our prayer of examine. Great and loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, over thousands of years, your people have endured so many reasons for fear, so many reasons for concern and loss. God, there have been epidemics in the past. There's been wars in the past. There's been illness in the past. There's been economic trauma in the past. There's been so many opportunities for people to fear. And God, over and over again, you meet us in the midst of our worry. God, you promise us that even though there is always a reason to be worried and sometimes are stronger than others, you are always there for us. You are always with us. Oh God, we are never alone because your power and presence in Christ and the Holy Spirit that walks alongside us every day. Together as a church, oh God, spread across miles and distance, but united with your word and your spirit. Help us as we first become aware of your presence. Wherever we are, oh God, Help us come to realize, to hear, to feel, and to know in our bodies, our spirits, and our minds, your presence with us today. God, let us look back on the previous days. Let us look back and please allow to arise in our minds and our hearts things that we can be grateful for so much cause for worry and concern, but in the midst of that also, God, are blessings and gifts, miracles, large and small. There's been laughter, there's been joy, there's been compassion, there's been relationships and hope. God, please raise up in our minds, I, those things right now for which we can praise your name and be thankful. God, I ask now, as we come together, that we each be allowed to focus on the emotions that are riding high. For some of us, that will be peace and grace, and oh God, we give you thanks for that. Some of us, God, are angry or worried, lonely or hurting. God, as we pay special attention to the emotions of our heart, let us do so with the knowledge of your presence and grace. God, as we look back on the previous days, let us pick one item, one element, one thing that's occurred to us, one thing that's come to mind, and let us guide our prayers from that. If it was a moment of anger, may we pray for peace. If it was a moment of feeling hurt or betrayed, may we pray for forgiveness. If it was a moment of fear, help us pray for hope. Let these meditations of our heart guide us as we look forward to the days to come. Loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our journey with you is not over. For the rest of this day and the day to come, O oh Lord, please lift up ways in which we might be your people. Please show us the manner in which we might abide in your grace. Please guide us so that we might be able to hear your spirit and experience your love in our lives now and always. God, you invite us to not fear. Help us to live in love in that trust. And it's in Jesus' name that together we pray the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who Lord art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.